Welcome. My name is Rick Cook, and I'm an LAI member from Vancouver, Canada. And it's my honor to co-chair the LAI Global Initiatives Committee. In our series of webinars on equitable residential appraisal, we have heard from an academic, the Federal Appraisal Subcommittee, the Federal Appraisal Foundation, and the Industry Appraisal Institute. Today, we hear from a national alliance speaking for those most impacted by the lack of equitable residential appraisal, communities of color. We recognize that the topics are broad, as are the interests of industries, communities, and individuals, all who are stakeholders. Our focus today is on the appraisal industry and within that broad context and diverse opinion. First, I'll provide a perspective on why this is not just a US story. These are my personal views and not those of my clients. The people of Tawasin First Nation, just north of the US border in Metro Vancouver, have been my planning clients since 2010. Indigenous people make up about 5% of Canada's population. This permit is an apt illustration of land relations between Canada and its First Nation people. The permits were issued by Canada's Indian agents for about 150, or for 50 years, but are rare artifacts now. And the agents controlled the movements of Indians off of the First Nation reserves. Edward, Indian number 125, is permitted by the agent to be absent from the reserve from the business of trapping and hunting for food. And Edward, therefore, had to earn the right from the, from the government to leave home, even to earn an income and to feed his family. And to my mind, this was a jail without a fence. And the land valuations reflected this enforced for generations by innocuous looking pieces of paper like this to prevent movement. It illustrates how simple administrative practices can have multi-generational negative impacts. Fast forward and we have a different story. After many years in 2009, Canada, British Columbia and Tawasin First Nation or TFN signed a unique treaty in the 15 years since treaty the economic impact has been significant. TFN has added approximately 1.8 million square feet of retail space, 1.4 million square feet of industrial space, and 3,600 new housing units are expected with about 40% already built. 85% of these will be, will be multifamily and most are ownership units. For the TFN members, there's been a shift from managing poverty to managing wealth, with homes typically changing from ones like the one on the left to more like the one on the, on the right. And the appraisal values have reflected, have reflected these improvements. Overall, assessment values have increased dramatically from 200 million US in 2009 to $3 billion in 2024, or 15 times in 15 years. There's still gaps between appraisals on the First Nation land and in neighboring communities, but overall the story is one of generational change in economic opportunity. And TFN has taken land that was considered worth next to nothing by outsiders prior to treaty and converted that land into assets that have improved the economic well-being of both original and new residents. 15 years after treaty, it is now a story of hope and the beginnings of reconciliation. As I, as I see it, LAI's interest in equitable residential appraisal parallels the First Nations story of hope and economic opportunity. We will hear about important individual examples from our speakers, but what also resonates for me are two recent pieces of big data research that show the ongoing and widespread challenge to achieve equitable residential appraisal for communities of color. Three generations after enactment of the Fair Housing Act, first in 2021, researchers at Freddie Mac found in a review of over 12 million appraisals, a property is more likely to receive an appraisal lower than the contract price if it is in a minority census tract. Second, in a 2022 report summarizing 32 million appraisals over a nine year period, found that in comparable homes in comparable neighborhoods, White neighborhoods are appraised at over twice as valuable as homes in communities of color. And as the chart shows, from 2013 through 2021, this gap is widening, not narrowing. 
These two big data surveys demonstrate why equitable appraisal remains an important systemic policy topic. Today, we hear from advocates for those most impacted when equitable residential, residential appraisal is missing. Welcome to two senior staff from the National Fair Housing Alliance, Maureen Yap, Senior Counsel for Fair Lending, and Siobhan Ferguson, Senior Associate Director of Enforcement. Siobhan has coordinated and led investigations to uncover housing discrimination in various housing markets. Following Maureen and Siobhan, an appraiser and LAI Philly member, Carlo Batts, will briefly respond, and then we will go to questions and answers. Please enter your questions in the chat, and we'll monitor that. Carlo is a principal of his own appraisal firm, Rittenhouse Appraisals, and serves on the Special Committee of the Appraisal Foundation. We are grateful to have such highly qualified speakers to share their knowledge with the LAI. Great. Thanks so much, Rick, for having us. Um, I'm going to open up our presentation here. And thanks to everyone for making the time today. Uh, we really appreciate it to consider this very important topic. Um, so here we are going to talk a little bit about appraisal bias and recommended reforms. Uh, we know that you've already heard a lot about uh, some of the, the evidence, statistics, research, um, and anecdotes surrounding appraisal bias. So we'll touch on that a little bit, and then we'll spend the bulk of the time uh, talking about uh, possible reforms at the federal agency level, and then uh, we'll take questions after. Uh, so first, a little bit of background. Wanted to tell you a little bit about our organization. We are the National Fair Housing Alliance. Um, we lead the fair housing movement in the United States, and we work to eliminate housing discrimination. We are also the umbrella organization for about 170 uh, different local fair housing groups across the United States. And we try to achieve this uh, through a number of ways, including advocacy on Capitol Hill in Washington, DC, um, working with state and local groups on technical assistance, education and outreach, um, and also uh, investigations and enforcement. And so, uh, although NAFA has been involved in all aspects of potential housing discrimination, including appraisals uh, for several decades, uh, most recently we became involved with the appraisal bias question when we were retained by the federal agency known as the Appraisal Subcommittee in about 2021 to examine the work of a standard setting organization called the Appraisal Foundation, or TAF. Um, TAF in the United States sets uh, the standards for what criteria a person has to fulfill to become an appraiser, and they also set the basics of how to conduct appraisals in the United States, but at a very, very high level. Um, typically, the appraisers in the United States look to uh, the investor, which a lot of times is Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac for the more precise guidelines. So TAF sets the standards at the very highest level. Since that time of releasing that report in January, 2022, uh, we've worked in various areas to uh, really promote the idea of uh, ensuring fair and accurate appraisals. So uh, we've worked on federal legislation, we've worked with the uh, federal agencies uh, attended uh, hearings in Congress, uh, presented testimony in Congress, um, and also uh, attended and presented at federal agency hearings. Uh, we've also, uh, as uh, Siobhan is about to talk to you about, worked on investigations and enforcement. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to uh, my colleague, Siobhan Ferguson, to talk more about the consumer experience and what we at NAFA have seen um, in terms of uh, investigations and enforcement. Siobhan? Thanks, Maureen. Um, I also just wanted to acknowledge that we understand that there's more to this issue than, um, you, know, uh, you know, appraisers who may be engaging in discrimination. We know that the, the, the issue about disparate treatment and disparate valuations is a complex problem. Um, and 
we know that that it's not just at the feet of the appraisers to solve this problem. Um, but we did want to spend some time talking about how we can all use our, you know, use our own behaviors, our own actions, our own understanding to try to solve the larger problem in whatever small way or big way that we can. Um, and for me, somebody who's been working in investigations and enforcement and fair housing for 12 years, part of my work is finding the evidence at a systemic level, but also getting the privilege of working with the clients who are confused initially when they interact with us um, after their experience and get to really hear directly from them what they have experienced and um, helping them through this process in order to find some, some form of justice. And I think sometimes in these conversations around um, when we're thinking about it from a really global perspective, we kind of miss the, the intricacies of a human experience. And I really want to touch on that today um, because their experience is, is important and valuable to add to the context of the data that you've already have had some experience um, or some sort of um, our presentations with previously. Um, there often we talk about, you know, the, the most clear point of of evidence of discrimination that we tend to point to is the difference in valuation, but the consumer experience is more than just a difference in opinion of the valuation um, at the end of their experience through a lending transaction or with an appraiser. And usually when I've interacted with a client or they come, you know, it's usually after they have, you know, maybe a few months later, they've been processing it and there's, and they had a recommendation to come to NAFA or to speak with HUD or some other government agency about their experience to figure out if what they experienced is lawful. And as we're talking and engaging, they share pieces of information that point to indications that maybe there's discrimination. And some of those things have been around statements. Uh, um, for example, I've had one particular client um, who, um, who said that, in a, you know, through the process of the appraiser, the appraiser made a comment about why is why is there black music playing um, right now? And it was obviously a little bit more a, a more egregious statement than that. Um, and didn't know the homeowner that lived there was black because the couple was biracial. Um, and the homeowner came out and had to, decided to bite his tongue because at the end of the day, he didn't want whatever interaction or how he responded, he didn't want that to affect the potential outcome of his appraisal and the loan going through. Um, had, um, you know, another experience where it's a little bit more subtle where the consumers or the homeowners had an appraiser come in and the appraiser um, was just asking questions that seemed inappropriate and a little bit invasive. Um, and some of those questions were, you know, made them feel that, you know, were questions like, how could you possibly afford this home? Or how could you afford the cars? And they had um, um, a specific collection, collection pieces throughout their home. Um, and the appraiser, every time the, the appraiser saw this collection piece would, um, would touch the, touch this collection, collector piece and say that they were checking to see if it was real or not, because they knew that if they touched it in this way from their own understanding, that they could determine whether it was real or not. And the, you know, as a consumer, um, they're, they're not thinking in that moment that that's like discriminatory. They're just thinking that's odd behavior. And as the interaction goes and goes and goes, you know, there's other invasive questions that surmount to just not feeling comfortable. Um, and then, you know, typically there's another another indication that's that appraisal report they eventually receive. They're not they may not be comfortable in that moment, that interaction, but they're just going to keep going with it because they don't want to affect the experience. They, you know, they they go with the flow. They get the appraisal report in both situations, and the appraisal report had significant inaccuracies. That one appraisal report or the experience of the consumer, where the appraiser is going through and touching their collect collection items had the, they were living in a pretty large home with several bedrooms but the appraisal report showed that they only had two bedrooms um on they only had one bathroom and this was a really big property um they um inaccurately described 
the boundaries of this neighborhood that's actually historical neighborhood and highly valued and conflated it with a neighborhood miles away that's distinctly different. Um, or another, the other experience where the, you know, the, the appraiser made that a comment about black music, their appraisal report, um, their final appraisal report had photos that were old and it made it seem like the home had not been completed. And the appraiser communicated to the lender that the home was not complete. Um, and also had inaccuracies in terms of um, the number of, you know, bedrooms or the description of the home. Um, and in both situations, the appraiser, they had experience with appraisers who said that it was going to be really difficult to appraise their home for X reason. Um, and when they tried to engage or interact with the appraiser or the lender, whomever, and, you know, question, you know, the, the, the data or the information, the appraisal report, they get pushed back and kind of, they kind of feel gaslit, um, or they don't even know that there's an actual process, um, you know, called the reconsideration, reconsideration evaluation to request for evaluation in order to, um, actually formally challenge the valuation that they received. Um, and then, um, and because of that, they kind of feel lost. Like what, what more can we do? Do we just accept this low valuation or do we ask some, you know, someone else? But usually from our experience, the consumers that come to us, they're going through this appraisal process because they are in, there, there is a financial reason, right? That's whether it's a change in an interest rate or they need to, um, you know, pay off a balloon payment or they need to refi refinance for whatever reason, there's a reason why they went through this process. And the process, you know, they, they kind of get in stuck into a rock and a hard place where they have to decide, do I settle with this low valuation and a different, you know, you know, a mischaracterization of her home and be financially stable? Or do I fight this and risk losing the home because we know this is inaccurate? Um, and from our experience, and, you know, they, what they choose is really, really personal. But sometimes when the, when the consumer chooses to go with a different valuation or a different lender and get a different difference in opinion, you, those evaluations jump. And unfortunately for some of our consumers, they have, an, be, because of their own life experience, they have some sort of maybe some sort of um, gut feeling that maybe this is about, not about the home and then it's about me, my, the color of my skin. And unfortunately, as you see here, many of our clients and clients who you have heard about have chosen the, the, the experience of whitewashing their home in order to see how their next appraiser or, you know, how that, how that might affect their next appraisal. Um, and that whitewashing experience is really harmful. One of the clients I'm working with right now, that's a biracial couple and the, um, the wife is white and the husband is, is, is African-American. They have children. And the husband said, before you go through the next appraisal, you know, whitewash her home. And she felt like, and she used her word. She was like, I felt like I was erasing my entire family from my home. She had to go through, they had a, a refrigerator with um, digital um, pictures. And she had to go in and remove all the pictures of her kids and her husband, the valuation jumped $200,000. Um, and then they had to go through another valuation as part of the, the loan process. Um, and the next time she was, she told her husband, she's like, I cannot do, I cannot erase off of my home again. I just cannot go through that process. And for whatever reason, there, something had come up and the husband had to be there. Um, she was going to be unavailable for the appraisal. I think it was like um, the appraiser came earlier than expected. And um, the, the valuation still jumped. Um, it went from $200,000 more to, there was an extra $100,000 from, so a total of a $300,000 difference from their first appraisal that they felt believed was discriminatory. Um, and she said that she, like just, she was, she, that to her was relieving that not every single appraiser and every single lender is discriminatory against her and her, her family and we had this conversation about no not every not every person is not every appraiser or lender is is engaged in discrimination but a process 
are going through this is traumatic. And so that's something she has to now think about when she's going through any sort of transaction moving forward. Um, and I think that's that piece I just wanted to share with you because you know this is life-changing. These experiences are life-changing for all parties involved. It's not just about the financial piece, it's also the emotional toll and the stress that our clients are experiencing and that they have to carry through even after a resolution of um, something settles. It's, you know, they might get a, a resolution of a few hundred thousand dollars, but that doesn't change the, they still have to live with this experience for the rest of their lives. Um, and then something, you know, I think the the other piece of the impact of the discrimination, that consumer that I, I'm talking about, the clients, because of their experience, they, because of the denial of the appraisal of the, of the, um, the, the original loan due to the appraisal appraisal that was with with false photos and inaccurate information, the bank would not approve the loan. The bank even said you might want to try some a different bank. And um, because the process, I mean, they had to try to go through the process again, and and that was obviously a long process, a longer process than expected. Um, they had had to take out you know, their, their savings account, borrow money from their, from their family, just to kind of continue to pay the bills that they were hoping that this, this new lending transact or this loan transaction would, would have covered. And um, that amount of fear and stress that they, that they were going to not, got, not going to be able to pay off some of their loans and that, that something was going to affect, was going to have to give was a huge stressor for the family. Um, when it didn't need to be, because they had a home that was significantly um, well within the value that 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 was needed in order to have the transaction move through. Um, and so I'm going to leave that there, but I just wanted to touch a little bit on what the, what our what our what our clients experience. I think maybe later we can have a little discussion about what it means to prove discrimination from my perspective, but. Um, I just wanted to make sure that people know that this is more than just a difference in opinion evaluation. And I'll pass it off to Maureen. Thanks so much, Yvonne. That was really powerful. And I think it's great to hear um, the consumer experience behind the numbers and uh, behind the, the reforms and, and why we're trying to do this work. Um, so I'm going to move to a much drier portion of the uh, of the presentation about the reforms, uh, looking at the structure that kind of reinforced these experiences that um, Siobhan talked about. And before we go into the reforms, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we at the National Fair Housing Alliance, or NAFA, think about this problem. So we think about it from the perspective of two aspects of civil rights law. There's um, sort of two theories of, of um, methods of proving uh, discrimination. And so one is called disparate impact. And for disparate impact, uh, the theory is showing that there's a racially neutral policy, so meaning a policy that doesn't explicitly talk about race, but that has a disproportionate impact or adverse effect on a protected class, such as um, uh, individuals of color or communities of color. And so in that bucket, we would put uh, the appraisal sales comparison approach itself. And so you've, you've already been through several uh, discussions talking about the sales comparison approach. And so you can kind of see that the sales comparison approach itself reinforces historical discrimination. So we know the history of redlining and other discriminatory policies in the United States that have led to undervaluation of communities of color um, and also in unfair and unwarranted association between race and risk. So that, you know, the historical um, uh, federal government policies that created the federal redlining maps associated anyone that was a person of color or that lived near a person of color as being more risky in terms of credit default risk, regardless of ability to pay. So that means that certain communities have been historically undervalued, even if their schools, crime rate, amenities, and the structure of the house are substantially similar to other areas. 
So that disparate, that um, the racially neutral policy of the sales comparison approach itself reinforces that that's a disparate impact issue. What we're mostly focused, so we, we are definitely having conversations with different thought leaders about how to rethink the sales comparison approach itself. But what we're going to talk about today is the second method of proving discrimination and the second also way of thinking about how to um, consider and uh, um, how to how to address this problem. And so that would be disparate treatment discrimination. And so that means that you have um, two groups that are similarly situated. So you have uh, basically same structure of house, same amenities, and then you get different outcomes. And there's an adverse outcome for an individual of color. So you may have two homes in the same neighborhood that are substantially similar um, and that are in substantially similar uh, neighborhoods or the same neighborhood, let's say it's a subdivision. Um, but the home of the black homeowners uh, gets a value that's substantially and materially less than the home of the white homeowners. And that's what we would call a disparate treatment case under the law. And so what we're trying to do is um, it's really a fundamentally a question of consistent treatment, which is just really quality control. Discrimination is really a market distortion here. The home should be a certain value, but it's a different value because of the actual perceived race of the homeowners or sometimes the neighborhood. And so what we're trying to do is look at the different structures that cause that outcome and try to make sure that there are uh, fair, accurate, and consistent outcomes. Um, the other thing that will that these uh, five recommended reforms are are recommendations for the federal agencies. So there's definitely a place for legislation, um, for talking to uh, state bodies also, but we're going to focus on federal agency law at the regulator level. One of the reasons for that is because uh, a couple years ago, the Biden administration stood up something called the PAVE um, Task Force, and that was a coalition of 13 federal agencies that touched on the appraisal process in some way. They came up with a very comprehensive plan, but unfortunately, the plan did not have any deadlines on it. So we have been uh, working with the administration, and we have a call with the White House on Monday to try to talk to them about how to priority, how to prioritize the many, many, many uh, recommendations they had so they could get some of them done and push those toward the finish line. So with that, I will just go ahead and start walking through. So um, the number one uh, recommendation we have is to focus on enforcement. And here uh, you can see a picture of Carlette Duffy from Indianapolis. And um, you can see that she's crying. And just like uh, Siobhan talked about, this is a very, very personal issue. So um, Ms. Duffy was focused in a, a documentary called Lowballed um, by ABC, which uh, we very much recommend. It's about an hour. And uh, she talked about her experience here um, in terms of whitewashing. And she was on a, a previous slide here. Uh, here she is, where she asked her white friend on the on the right um, to stand in for her, and the home went up by one hundred and forty nine thousand dollars in Indiana. And so, in this uh, documentary, she talks about the fact that all of a sudden she knew that what was bringing the value of her home down was her, and is a very emotional and and powerful moment, um, as Siobhan has described. So the issue here is that sometimes when there is reason to believe that there's a discriminatory valuation, uh, there aren't really reasonable, efficient processes to uh, available to consumers to ensure access to their rights under law. Um, so our number one uh, recommendation uh, to the White House and to the administrative agencies is to resolve the complaints. So the consumer has the option of uh, several different venues, including federal courts. And there have been a couple of cases that have come out of the federal courts 
which as slow as they are, have still moved faster than the US Department of Housing and Urban Development or HUD. And to our knowledge, they have about 160 consumer complaints uh, alleging appraisal discrimination. And that includes um, complaints that are up to four years old. And so while that is part of the PAVE action plan, um, uh, we want that to be the number one priority. And that's for two reasons. One, to provide relief to harmed consumers. Um, they have followed the law, they have filed the complaints in a timely manner, and they deserve some sort of answer and or relief. Um, sometimes because the lenders know and lenders and appraisers know that HUD is not going to be able to uh, resolve the complaint or facilit facilitate an agreement. Um, they settle out of court. It's non-public. It's not as much as the consumer would normally be due. And um, that means that there's no uh, public precedent. And then the second is, is really to provide a resolution for uh, the accused respondents, and that would be the lenders and appraisers. It's not fair to them either to have this hanging over their head uh, when maybe in this case, it's a case of negligence as opposed to uh, racial discrimination, or maybe there's really no issue at all. Sometimes a complaint is filed and it just doesn't really have merit. Um, but uh, HUD refuses or has not been able to uh, resolve these complaints. So that would be our number one uh, recommendation. And as I mentioned, the third reason is to create public precedent so that we understand the kind of fact patterns, we as a whole understand the kind of fact patterns that show appraisal discrimination so that we can advise others and lenders and appraisers and, and appraisal management companies or AMCs can figure out what they need to do to ensure consistent treatment. The second issue is supervision and supervision is different than enforcement. So supervision, is where you have a regulator, and in this case, this would be a banking regulator like the Federal Reserve, that can go on site to a lender or a bank and uh, supervise them for compliance. So in enforcement, you, the, the agency has to ask for the documents, subpoena the documents, um, and so they don't kind of really know what is happening there. But with supervision, they have what's called visitorial powers so they can go on site, they have access to everything, and they can kind of see uh, the extent to which the, the lender or appraiser is, uh, sorry, the lender is complying with the law to the extent that they are working with third party appraisers. So it's not a direct oversight of the appraisers, um, but it is of the lenders who then uh, work with those appraisers. The other advantage of supervision is that uh, the agency has uh, certain supervisory powers um, which would lead to what they call MRAs or matters requiring attention. So it doesn't have to be that there is a violation of law and the consumer deserves restitution. It could be your systems are a bit weak. They're really not strong enough to prevent uh, a violation. And maybe you didn't have a violation this time, but if you keep going down this path, it's not great. And it, there's a really high risk of consumer harm. So the lender can sort of tell you, tell the lender, uh, the agencies can sort of tell the lender, these are the things we want to see by the time of the next exam. So it's really important that there be examination procedures in place. And when we think about it, um, the, the Fair Housing Act is probably the most comprehensive act in terms of covering appraisal discrimination. It's been around since 1968, and yet the agencies have not issued public examination procedures to supervise for compliance, which means they're not doing it. They're not looking at the lenders, um, which would be the greatest leverage point for uh, oversight of the third party appraisers. So our second recommendation is for the federal regulators, like the Federal Reserve, Office of Controller of the Currency, and the federal, uh, the FDIC, to issue public exam procedures to identify appraisal discrimination. That would mean that the examiners have instructions on how to look at the lenders. The third area of recommendations has to do with data. 
So uh, many of you know, in the United States, there's a law called HUMDA or Home Mortgage Disclosure Act, which requires certain lenders to collect mortgage lending information, including uh, the race um, and other protected uh, classes relating to the mortgage applicant. And through the, that collection of data, then the public can do more research. Um, lenders themselves can more easily analyze their own data um, and look for weaknesses. And the public can also take enforcement actions. Um, and it also helps the agencies take enforcement actions. So they can look for disparate treatment. They can look for groups, for example, that are similarly situated. Maybe they have the same credit score, the same loan to value ratio, et cetera, et cetera. If one group gets a different price, say black applicants on upper uh, or gets a different price when they're similarly situated, then that's a violation of law. So in this case, um, we have kind of a reverse Honda. With Honda, we didn't have the data, but the law required the data be collected and then it was released to the public. Here, the data exists. So there is uh, data that exists at the property level. Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, uh, FHA uh, for FHA loans, VA for VA loans, and USDA for rural housing loans have that data and have essentially the same fields, but it's not released to the public. And there's no law requiring it released to the public, but there's also no, no law prohibiting it. So by releasing that data, the public would have access to understanding better the causes of discrimination. Lenders themselves could and AMCs and appraisers could develop better compliance management programs. And uh, then finally, uh, advocates could um, much more easily look at enforcement actions. So our third recommendation is to release the appraisal data we do understand that there are consumer privacy concerns and under HMDA, the agencies have figured out ways to release the data while balancing the consumer privacy issues. Um, but honestly, given the rise of Zillow and Redfin and um, the uh, digitizing many of the property records, um, there's a lot less of an argument uh, that this information is private and not already available to the public. The fourth issue is the appraisal profession. So because of the way the appraisal foundation has set up the criteria to entry, that particular structure has led to, has had the impact and effect of creating a, a profession that is the least diverse in terms of race and in terms of, uh, well, and one of the least diverse in terms of male, female. Um, so this data is a little bit old. So uh, now it's probably 95% white. So maybe a 2% um, uh, improvement in terms of diversity, but still incredibly non-diverse. And then only about 30% female. And one of the biggest reasons is uh, what they call a supervisory training requirement, which is like the old guilds. So the... Uh, entrant to the profession has to take a bunch of classes. The classes are expensive. Even when they finish the classes, though, they have to find a supervisor. And because the supervisor doesn't get paid, it has to share their time and their fees, it doesn't tend to be something that anyone wants to sign up for. And honestly, I wouldn't want to sign up for it either. So what tends to happen is that the appraisal profession is passed down through the generations. And so if you're an older white male, then you're probably going to pass it to another uh, white male within your uh, within your family, because otherwise, why would you um, take the time to help a complete stranger um, by uh, splitting your fee, uh, uh, you know, uh, reducing your time on the job? And then also you're training your competition. So that's somebody who's going to then take their license and compete against you in the same field. So it's just not a sustainable model. And it also is highly discouraging and creates a huge barrier to entry um, for those who are not already in the profession, which would be um, non-white and female individuals. 
So these criteria are set by the appraisal sub or sorry, by the appraisal foundation. The appraisal foundation is somewhat overseen by the appraisal subcommittee. The subcommittee is actually a federal agency. Um, and we can get more in depth in that if you want. We would uh, recommend that they undertake a public and transparent review of each barrier to entry, including the supervisory appraiser requirement, and look for disparate impact. So this is not under housing civil rights law, but employment civil rights law is the same idea. There can be something that's racially neutral, like the supervisory appraiser requirement, but it has a disproportionate effect on a prohibitive basis, such as race and gender. And then the last um, uh, recommendation we have has to do with training. So the appraisal foundation and it's uh, the subcommittee overseeing that has changed uh, the, the uh, requirements for training. So for the first time, um, the training will actually be required, fair housing training will actually be required in uh, 2026. And appraisers will be required to take seven hours of training. So if you think about it again, the law has been around since 1968. And in fact, the manuals were not, were not changed once the Fair Housing Act was passed. So even as late as the 1970s, the appraisal no, sorry, the appraiser um, trade association training manual actually had explicitly racial bases for evaluating a home. And so the highest value was to be given to um, homogeneous, meaning same, basically all white neighborhoods. So again, that association between race and credit risk and race and value. Uh, regardless of the condition or quality of the home or amenities of the neighborhood. So that was actually in the um, in the manual. And it wasn't until 1976 that the Department of Justice had to sue the trade association to get that out. And the trade association still battled the Department of Justice um, and even took some of that on appeal to try to keep the race-based evaluation in the training manual. So finally, this was settled in 1977. The Trade Association removed the explicitly race-based evaluations, but nobody ever required training. So some of the folks who were trained and that are still working today have never received the proper training. So now there will be training, um, but there's no guarantee that the, that the list of topics will be developed by fair housing experts. So we have seen some training that centers the appraiser as victim and talks about the many ways um, that this situation is so very hard for appraisers um, and what they can do in the event that they get sued so that, um, you know, reassuring them at that uh, literally it says that bad things happen to good people. And that may be true. There may be frivolous uh, complaints, but the idea is to think more about, as Siobhan was saying, how the cons consumer should be sent and what can be done to ensure consistent treatment rather than kind of bemoaning the fact that um, appraisers now have to uh, do more to comply with the law. And to be clear, realtors, uh, real estate agents, um, lenders, underwriters, insurance companies have been uh, working on this issue since the 1990s. So to have the appraisers now say that they've sort of being singled out um, doesn't really align with the, the history of uh, mortgage lending and how the other facets of the industry have been working really hard to ensure consistent treatment since DOJ started uh, to ramp up enforcement in the 1990s. So our recommendation would be to require appropriate fair housing training or ensure and promote appropriate fair housing training. So we would recommend that the federal agency, the appraisal subcommittee work with the appraisal foundation and the states to ensure that the appraisers receive comprehensive and accurate fair housing training developed by fair housing experts, um, typically lawyers, 
and they can be um, advocates like NAFA or they can be defense side, but folks who are not just appraisers, but folks who really understand civil rights law, the history of um, real estate and lending discrimination and can put together a plan and uh, training that really advise um, uh, appraisers on how to uh, protect the consumer and avoid liability and avoid harm to consumers. Um, so with that, I'm gonna stop sharing and see what questions we have. Thanks so much. Thank you, Maureen. Carlo, um, are you ready to do a little response and maybe pose the first question for our guests? Sure. Um, first of all, uh, Maureen and Siobhan, thank you for your great presentation and a kind of an update to the status of where we are as far as uh, fair housing here in America, as well as the appraisal process and equality in lending. Um, looking at this presentation, which was phenomenal, um, I want to make sure that we uh, keep in mind that the appraiser, especially in the mortgage lending process, is kind of like the, the in person in a long trail of the lending process to lend on real estate and that we're out in the field doing our job. And even if we look at the number of cases that where we found there was something there, it's only a, a minor percentage of the appraisal profession and the appraisals that were done within that time period. And I say all that to say that overall, our profession uh, represents quality people that are out trying to do a quality job and do the best they can do uh, out in the field, given the circumstances. So I wanna make sure that everybody keeps that in mind and that they understand that over the past 30 years or since the SNL crisis, uh, demand for real estate appraising and demand for real estate has totally evolved uh, since then. And that now real estate has become more of an investable asset that has become more of a play, a playground for people. And we've seen demand for mortgages increase sharply while those entering into our profession, as you had highlighted, has declined and the average age of an appraiser is, I believe, 70 or so years old. And there is usually a 70 year old white male and America has definitely become more diverse. So there is a unique problem there that we need to figure out. And quite simply, uh, creating more appraisers is not an overnight process to do the quality job that everybody needs to be done. Um, so for my first question, I would like to ask Maureen and Siobhan, um, how much of this process or how can y'all ensure or have y'all looked at the quality of the process of how the lender, um, the lender's process of going through the uh, picking the appraiser in this because everything starts with the public trust and as a mortgage applicant i'm trusting that my bank that i'm going to is going to manage a thorough process for me and that the appraiser they're sending out is qualified to appraise my property in my neighborhood so have y'all looked at that and has there any been anything from that angle done yeah, thanks so much, Carlo. So I want to address also uh, what you said here in terms of um, uh, the the appraisers and the sort of uh, percentage of cases. So I do want to explain um, because when uh, anyone hears information like this, it's hard not to feel attacked. And what we try to folks is the legal test is not what's in your heart. So the advocate, the consumer can't tell what's in your heart and um, how you feel and what the intent was. The legal test is that there was, um, if one of the legal tests is that there were similarly situated um, folks or cases and uh, there's an unexplained difference. So for example, if you have an appraiser that uh, looked at um, a series of homes that were about the same, but for the home with a Black homeowner, 
they used a different process or they came out with a different number, then regardless, the, the legal test and the, the court will not look at, um, you know, what's in the person's heart. They can't, they can't see that. And, uh, but what they will look at is the difference. And if there's no legitimate non-discriminatory reason for the difference, then under the law, that's considered disparate treatment discrimination. And that's a type of thing, um, the sort of like subtle area of the law that's so important and why it's so important for fair housing training to be developed by uh, fair housing experts so they can explain that. So if you're an appraiser trying to teach this without that understanding of how the law works, it's it can actually be a disservice to the appraisers because it ends up increasing their liability. They think that if there's no smoking gun and they're basically a good person and there was just a mistake or negligence, then they shouldn't be held liable, but that's not how the law works. So understanding the importance of putting in consistent processes so that everyone gets the same treatment. So I wanted to, to um, talk about that and you know how it feels to receive this message that some of these appraisers are appraisals are going through in an inconsistent manner and uh, what the law will look at and that it's not a judgment on you or anyone else as a person, it's a judgment on a process that has gone awry and that the consumer needs to be made whole. So and the second thing, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Siobhan. No, go ahead, I'll, I'll go after you, go ahead. Okay, yep, you asked about um, the lender processes and how the lenders choose the appraisers. That's a great question. Um, I think more is being done to try to track the appraisers and the appraisers that could be a problem. Fannie and Freddie, for example, are doing a lot more to um, do quality control on the end and keep track of the ones that uh, the appraisals that show up again and again from the same appraiser to have problems. So, for example, an easy an easy example is they've done a lot more to track appraisals that have what is called overt statements. That's another type of disparate treatment discrimination. Um, so for example, if the appraisal talks about this is in Koreatown, or there's a big Spanish speaking population, or this is uh, most of the population are working class black families, that's irrelevant to the um, valuation uh, and it shouldn't be in there. And so to the extent Fannie and Freddie can show that this appraiser keeps, uh, you know, focusing on the racial makeup um, or even the religious makeup, there's been instances of saying, you know, there's uh, Jewish delis in the area, things like that, um, then uh, they can flag that information, they can send it back to the lender, they can also start referring uh, those folks to the state regulators. Um, so that's one thing. And then the second thing is that uh, some of the agencies have come out with what they call reconsideration of value um, processes. And uh, so that's HUD's FHA and then Fannie and Freddie have new reconsideration of value processes. And what that means is uh, they have better and more consistent pro or they will be required to have better and more consistent processes in terms of if a consumer says, I think there's something wrong with this appraisal. And if uh, uh, the next level would be, I think there's something wrong and I think it's discriminatory, what are the um, avenues that the lender has to take in order to address that? And a reconsideration of value means that they go back to the same appraiser and say, take a look at this, here are some other comps to look at, um, et cetera. In addition, what these new processes uh, say is that there's no requirement for reconsideration of value. That is, the lender does not have to go back to the same appraiser. Because imagine you're in the consumer's position and you come forward and say, I think this appraiser acted in a discriminatory way. And the lender says, OK, great. We'll just go back to the same appraiser and ask them to do it again. That doesn't give you a lot of confidence. So what these processes say is that there's nothing in the law that requires that. And instead, if the lender has enough indicia of uh, material issues, including discrimination, then they can go straight to what's called a second appraisal. And that means that they get a second appraiser to come out to the home. At, and under FHA, there cannot be a, a charge to the consumer for that. 
So there is some progress being made in uh, requiring the lenders to do better with their processes, um, but you know there's still a ways to go. And I'll can I add, can I ask one follow up question to that? And I think this is kind of where I personally have seen the issues kind of arrive from. Are there any checks and balances in place to make sure that the appraiser that's being sent to that house in that neighborhood has experience in appraising property? in that neighborhood and they're sending out a qualified appraiser to conduct that assignment and mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah oh i'm sorry go ahead finish carla sorry no that was just my my question is that and that i wanted to make sure and then also um that the there by the fee that's being paid to the appraiser that they're getting a fee of just compensation to do a quality assignment and has the bank been mortgage company um, stepped up to the plate to kind of oversee, making sure that that process is being carried through? Because they, the onus is really of trust is come starting at the bank, not at the appraiser, because the 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 homeowner or the potential purchaser filled out the application with the mortgage company, not with the appraiser. Mm hmm. So um, I think so that there's a number of things embedded in there. So one um, important point uh, that Carlo is making here is that the um, the duty of care and the client is between the lender and the appraiser. So the consumer does not actually have um, negligence rights uh, because there's no duty of care from the appraiser to the consumer, um, which is a big sort of point of contention. And there's there's going to be some thoughts around that. I think uh, some 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 policy uh, potential policy reforms around that. Um, the second is about the appraisal fee, and the appraisers have been squeezed a lot on their fees um, coming from the uh, appraisal management companies and the lenders. Um, so they they face a lot of pressure, a pressure on um, the fees and the turnaround time. So um, there could be issues with with. Uh, with quality or incentives, the lenders could um, be incentivized to just sort of pick the lowest um, fee as opposed to the best appraiser for that area. On the third point, though, I would reframe it a little bit because under um, USPAP, the Uniform Standards of Professional Appraisal Practice, the appraiser has to certify that they are competent to review that property in that geography in that neighborhood, and they have to sign something saying that. Um, now, again, the duty of care, though, the negligence runs between the appraiser and the lender. So um, in some of the cases, the consumer has tried to sue on that issue, and the court has said there's no duty of care. Um, the lender would have to sue. But we have seen instances, for example, that, um, that definitely raised that issue. So we had um, uh, somebody come in um, uh, on the basis of religion in an area called Prince George's County in Maryland, um, which is a majority black area. And uh, the lender had flown out an appraiser from Detroit, which is um, another majority black area to evaluate uh, a home in Prince George's County, Maryland. Um, and maybe because they thought that a black community should be evaluated by a black community, but Prince George's County, um, which is, you know, highly kind of suburban McMansions is a lot different than um, Detroit, where I grew up, which is much older neighborhoods. Um, so it felt like they had, you know, flown out an appraiser on the basis of race rather than on the basis of the type of home. Um, so that's definitely an issue, but the appraiser definitely also has um, an obligation under, under their standards of practice to um, uh, verify and represent their competence to uh, review that area, and they can be sued or um, face consequences for their license under um, under the state regulatory body for evaluating the area they're not uh, competent to review. Siobhan, do you have 30 seconds, and then you can just leave really 30 seconds to end as well. Thanks. Just really quickly, um, Carlo, I just wanted to make sure everyone knows that, one, I understand that there's this complicated relationship between lenders and appraisers, and really you have to you have to consider as an appraiser, am I going to be able to still get a job from these lenders if I go against the grain? 
Um, and that's something that real estate agents and leasing agents also experience. Um, but I think it's important for for to highlight that it it at the end of the day it doesn't matter if you in, if you're involved in a discriminatory action, um, then you are going to be held liable for discrimination. And um, we just need to make sure that you know if if you are if you if the case is filed against you um, for for discrimination, one way to protect yourself is also to say, listen, I tried and told them that this was wrong, and they threatened me in this way. And you have fair housing rights as well. You can say that the you can say the lender or prove that the lender is no longer working with you because you chose not to engage in discrimination, um, as do other housing providers. Thank you, Siobhan Ferguson, Maureen Yap, and uh, Carlo Batz of uh, an appraiser from LAI uh, Philly chapter, and uh, Maureen and Siobhan from the National Fair Housing Alliance for this critical perspective from consumers on how to achieve equitable residential appraisal in America. We we'll look forward to checking back in on progress in the next few months and years. I also want to thank Rachel Ed Eads of our LAI Global Initiative Committee for her leadership in bringing this series to us together with her co-committee um, members, Christopher Deutsch of New York, Joe Nathanson, Susanna Bergman of Bar Baltimore, and John DeVries of Chicago. Please join us in our next Global Initiatives webinar to be held on June 13th at noon Eastern for an introduction to water and land economics featuring distinguished professor Dr. Jay Lund from UC Davis Center for Watershed, Watershed Services, Stephen Sow, a professional engineer expert in stormwater management in Southwest Florida, and Dr. Brad Bass, senior policy analyst expert on water quality in the Great Lakes. And join us on October 16th to 18th in Phoenix, Arizona at our annual land economics gathering. Thank you again for attending our Color of Law 2 series on equitable residential appraisal. We'll post a summary with links to keynotes.